No, no rush, man. Take your time. <laughs> Hey, good morning, my brothers and sisters. How y'all doing this morning? Are you live and kicking out there? Are you awake? I'm good, Mark. Angel? Thanks. Matt's awake. I'm good. All right. Welcome to Range Community Bible Church. Great to have you with us. Uh, do something for me. Would you uh, get up on your feet to stand up? I knew you could do it. Well done. Just stand up. Come on. Come on. Stand up. All right. Good job. Good. Good. Okay, here's the deal, all right? Get up on your feet, I want you to take a big, deep breath now. Let's get lots of air to sink. Come on, put your hands in. Breathe it out. One more time. Breathe it in. Breathe it out. Okay, now. Take your hands up in the air and stretch it on you. Come on. Breathe it out. Feel good, all right? Do you know that this is the way that you can feel this time? Do you know that you can feel this time? Do you know that you can feel this time? Do you know that you can feel this time? All right. Breathe it out. Sweet, sweet. 
Wow, that was quite an introduction. Okay. Well, I wanted to first of all welcome you to Range Community Bible Church. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, if you're new and visiting, <laughs> so am I. I'm not visiting. I'm here to stay. <laughs> but I am new. So I just want to welcome you and to say that we're glad you're here. There's a lot going on, so that means I have copious amounts of announcements to let you know about all the things going on, okay? So bear with me. So first of all, we have connection cards. We want to invite you to fill out a connection card if you're new especially, um, so that way we can get connected with you. And if you write on there, meet for coffee, I'll, I would be happy to meet with you for coffee if you're new, okay? Um, and if you have prayer requests, write that in there. We'd be happy to be praying with you and for you. And then next we have Wednesday nights, our family nights, and so that's at 6 o'clock. There's things from kindergarten all the way up to old people, right? I'm adults. I'm just joking, okay? <laughs> all of us in between, right? We're all, we're, there's something going on for all of us, right? Um, and then we need volunteers. They're going to be cleaning out the attic on Saturday, April 20th. So uh, you know the adage, many hands make light work. So um, it's a fun way to connect with people too, especially if you like to work and just get your hands dirty and just kind of work with people. It's a great way to connect with others. And then we have a leadership training class, and that's on April 21st at 8.30. And that's going to be at the Sunday school hour time. And that, that class is titled Lead Like Christ. This is a leadership training class. This is for men and women. Um, for you, this is a great opportunity for you to be a lay leader, to get trained, to grow. Whether it's, whether it's leading in your home or within the church context, this would be so helpful. And so we want to invite you to show up to class. Let's fill the classroom so we can raise up leaders at range. And so that's going to be a great time. And if you attended a leadership class last fall, it's not it. It's just, this is different, okay? So, um, so if you're like, oh, yeah, I already did that. This is completely different. I don't know what they did because I wasn't here, but it's different, okay? <laughs> All right. So, and then, uh, let's see. Next, we have an Italian food fellowship on the 21st. The church is going to provide the main dish. This church is about potluck, aren't they? Isn't this awesome, right? <laughs> so anyway, so the 21st is an Italian food potluck. There's uh, sides at the back you can sign up for, and so I want to invite you to do that. Uh, next, we have a congregational input meeting on April 28th, and that's after the service, and that's regarding the distinctives of range. So if you have input for that and want to be a part of that conversation, we invite you for that. That'll be after the service. Whew, okay, and then next we have a unity breakfast that's coming up for men and women, and I'm not going to announce that. I'm going to invite Tony and Cynthia up to come and share some of those details. So they're going to share the details of the men's and women's unity breakfast coming up. Good morning. Uh, we have an opportunity to unify all the churches in the community. So what we've decided to do is try to get everybody from every church. I know everybody out here knows somebody that's probably attending another church. Some of the roots of the family, ah, they got roots everywhere throughout here. <laughs> Eli, uh, uh, Amanda, uh, Amber, and Travis Hollenbeck. Okay, so what we want to do is unify around the gospel. All right? We have too many divides in this community about little things, little 
documents, little distinctives, when we all should be unifying around the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what saves us. The rest of the little things are not hills to die on. It's time to unify so that we can reach others. It says in Proverbs 27, 17, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So we are getting together for the men's breakfast on May 11th at 8.30 in the morning. There's going to be great food, great fellowship, men. Come. Be part of it. You don't have to participate. Just eat and enjoy hearing what other men are doing and saying to each other. Okay? If you know somebody that's attending another church that just wants to have a breakfast, if you know somebody who's not a, a believer, bring them. And let's get this thing going. Amen. <laughs> ditto. Ditto, ditto, ditto. Amen. Ditto, ditto, ditto. Because, hey, we can't walk together unless we agree. That's right. Ditto. Okay, so, you know, in the name of separation, non-unity, oh. I'm representing the women. All the girls say, hey. Hey. Wow. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Oh, man. <laughs> whatever so we're having a women's breakfast and because it's women you know it's gonna be good because we can't cook <laughs> yen can cook and so can we the women's breakfast is may 4th and it's at sharon lutheran church praise god for that you know yeah here at range we start stuff we do stuff after all we are the city on the hill for real, for real, right? Amen. Location is everything. But, you know, we got to come together in our community. So instead of having it here where everybody thinks, oh, my gosh, there's range again, we're having it at Sharon Lutheran, and that's in Besmer. It's at 10 a.m., and once again, it's not a pot luck because we're women. We can cook. It's a pot bless. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, it's an eating meeting. That's what I call them. Another eating meeting for Jesus. Hallelujah. Because work, work gets done when we eat food, right? That's Amen. Breaking bread. Breaking bread. Hallelujah. Yeah. So like he said, diddle, 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 diddle. And all the women, if you know someone, bring them. They can be not quite seasoned. They can be seasoned or they can be well seasoned. But bring them. Bring them. Bring the ones that are not churched. So they can see what it's like to be at an eating meeting. So they have something to look forward to, you know, because that's what we do best, right? Mm. <laughs> the word is the bread. We eat that. That's it. Yeah, so eat come. It Take it in. Okay. Okay. So come one, come all. Thank you. Okay. Did anyone else notice that Tony totally did not need a microphone? Like, <laughs> it was superfluous. All right. Um, I have one final announcement. August 12th through the 16th. Uh, no, that's a new date for VBS. We have August 12th through the 16th is VBS. So mark your calendars. We need workers. We need people. Uh, look, folks, we need, if we're going to do it, we might as well do it really, really well. And so the only way to do it is to do it well. So let's round up the troops. Let's come together. Let's make it happen. And let's do it well. And so that said, um, we also, when we are doing this, this isn't just an outreach to a bunch of kids. It's families, right? They're going to be coming in our doors. And so let's be mindful of that. And so let's start praying about it and, and considering how you might be a part of um, serving at VBS. And maybe it's just to be a friendly person who says hi. All right? So um, I'm going to invite our ushers forward, and we're going to pray for the service, and then I will be done with announcements, okay? So let's pray. So our Father, I thank you so much for a chance to be a part of this church community that truly is a city on a hill, a building on a hill, a light in darkness. And so I pray that you'd help us to press in uh, with fullness, with excitement, and with joy for the work that you have before us. And so I thank you for the mission that you've entrusted to us. I pray that you'd help us to be a church that unifies with other churches who are like-minded, who believe the same gospel. But may that unity pervade our own church as well. This is bigger than just the other churches, but may it be so here too. And so, Father, I pray that you'd be with us this morning as we uh, hear the preached word, as we grow. And I pray that you'd be with us in the giving of our tithes and offerings. But may we put ourselves in that basket, not just our money. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
loud and sing it proud. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. I am blessed. I am called. I am healed. I am whole. I am saved. children may be dismissed to Children's Church. Okay, I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker this morning. Uh, he was here yesterday, Jim Halstead, um, leads Go and Tell Workshop, and it's on evangelism. Uh, the best thing I can say about Jim Halstead that I know about him is that he's a practicer of what he's preaching. This guy is an evangelist through and through. At the heart level, he is an evangelist. He loves Jesus, and he loves people, and he wants to make Jesus known. He's been a pastor, and he was always an evangelist as a pastor, and so I think he's living out his true calling now as he equips churches to do evangelism. And, and, and as I thought about this, and as I look at this week, and I think, man, this is perfect timing as I think about we're entering a new phase of ministry together, um, and I get to have the privilege of stepping in as your next lead pastor. And so here we are, and how cool is this, right? Amen. And so um, Jim has a table at the back where he's got books for sale. If there's something that really resonates with you or stands out to you, if you're interested in growing in this, because he makes this very simple, simple and repeatable, so that normal people like us can do this, right? And so uh, we will probably be, we'll be making available uh, materials so you can do this in a small group or a home group context. And so just so you know, it's going to be available. And there's more resources. And if you're like, man, I just love what he's doing and I want to support him, that's how he does this, to come to small churches like this. And that's part of his way is to, uh, of being able to do this is by people providing support for him. So if you feel so led, I just want to encourage you to consider that as well. So I'm going to pray for Jim because we're going to be people who pray a lot. And so I'm going to pray for Jim, and he's probably going to pray too, but I'm going to pray. And so here we go, all right? Well, Father, I just thank you so much for Jim, um, for him being here today. I thank you for the workshop that he led us through yesterday. I pray that you would use this to light us on fire for Jesus' sake to transform the range community through the gospel. May we be those who embody this, and may we be those who do this. And so I pray that today would be an encouragement. I pray that you'd be with Jim as he speaks, that you'd anoint him by your spirit. And for some that maybe need to be encouraged to share their faith, maybe others need to simply hear the gospel today. And I pray that you'd help them to hear and to believe, and maybe that you would turn their life upside down themselves unknowingly. <laughs> it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Thank you. 
Hey, thanks, Josh. Uh, Thanks, Range Community Bible Church, having me here. I've had a great weekend, and it's great. I'm so excited for you, Pastor Josh, coming to be on staff, and Pastor Tyler. It's been a fun weekend. Uh, Again, I'm Jim Halstead. I have pastored for 35-plus years with the Evangelical Free Church in Florida, with the Christian Missionary Alliance Church, and also the Christian Reformed Church. I've also, for 10 years, I was a special education teacher in the state of Indiana. And combining all of that, I... Uh, four years ago, retired from the pastorate. I taught one more year, and I developed Go and Tell Ministries. I found it. I wrote all the materials to go and equip the church to share the gospel and make disciples. And I literally traveled the nation. Uh, matter of fact, um, all my materials have been translated in Swahili, and Pastor John in Tanzania is traveling 500 miles to preach it in another church in Tanzania, which is amazing to me. But as we get started today, I've, I've got a question for you. And if you've got a, a seasoned saint, you have some years on you, you you'll probably picture some things. Have you ever been with someone when they've died and you've held their hand and you've heard their last words? If you've done that, you remember that. Uh, Four years ago, my father passed away, and I I got a phone call. He was in the hospital in Indianapolis. I live in Fort Wayne. I saw him on Wednesday, and Saturday we thought he was going to be moving in with my sister, had like nine months to live, and I left him, and I preached on Sunday. Monday, I'm teaching school, and I get a phone call at the school. Your, your dad never made it to your sister. As a matter of fact, he's dying. Get here as soon as you can. I actually drove through a snowstorm, and I was able to be with my dad that night, held his hands when he died. He never woke up, and I was with him. I didn't know Saturday was my last words from my father, but I remember his last words. I love you, son. You remember those last words. When I was pastor at an evangelical free church in Florida, it's called Sunrise Community Church, I, I was hired as the assistant pastor. The senior pastor, Jim Cheshire, was gone. Kathy was an old saint of the church. Her family was trying to come in to get her. She was at Baptist Hospital, downtown Jacksonville. And if you ever watch the Jacksonville Jaguars on TV, it's on the St. John's River, and Baptist Hospital's right there on that river. Matter of fact, all three of my kids were born in that hospital. So I'm there with Kathy, and, and, and I'm a rookie pastor. I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm just reading Scripture, praying, and she's resting. And all of a sudden, she woke up. She sat up in her seat. Her hand was shaking, and she looked out the window to the St. John's River, and she said this, I see Jesus coming to get me in a boat. Well, what did I do? <laughs> I looked out the window is what I did. So I got up and I'm looking out the window, unknown to me, she laid back down and died. And when she died, the nurses came in and I'm looking out the window and they go, Pastor, 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 what in the world are you doing? I'm looking for a boat. (laughs) I think when I see Kathy in heaven, I think I'm going to see somehow Jesus came to get her in a boat. You see, when when you're with people and you hear those last words, you don't forget them. Do you remember Jesus' last words? The last words before he was ascended into heaven. Do you remember what he what he said? What's amazing is the church in America, I think, has forgotten. Barna did a study recently. A majority of United States churchgoers, fifty one percent say they have never heard of the Great Commission. That was Jesus' last word before he ascended into heaven. Some said we didn't know. Some said, you know, I've heard of the Great Commission, but I don't know where it is in the Bible. Only 17% of people surveyed said the Great Commission, Jesus' last word before He ascended, was found in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And I want to read that to you today. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go. And make disciples of all names, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I'm going to preach on this text, and as Josh said, I'm going to pray before I do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask for your anointing on the word preached today. I ask that you would raise up workers to make disciples for the glory of your name. And Father... May the words of my mouth and may the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You know, the Great Commission, 
The phrase taken to this was really kind of coined by Hudson Taylor, William Carey, missionaries in the 1800s. But the thought of this passage as a focal point of the church goes all the way back to St. Augustine in 300 A.D. And often when we think of the Great Commission, we think the one command is going. That is not the command. There is one command, and that command is to make disciples. The command is make disciples, and then Jesus gives three ways of how you're going to fulfill that. And so the, the question thus is, is, what is a disciple of Jesus Christ? I think, simply put, a disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. It's someone who has seen their sin, they repented of their sins, they've trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and they follow Him for His glory. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And the command is that we're called to what? To make disciples of all nations. So just picture this. Jesus is with His eleven disciples. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And He's told them not only to make disciples, but to make disciples of what? All nations. Did He really think those eleven could reach the world? Or how about us in this room? What do you think would be quicker? If I was an evangelist and I went every day and I won a thousand people to faith in Jesus Christ, how long would it take me to reach the world, do you think? A thousand a day as I'm going and sharing the gospel. Or we do it this way. I disciple Joe for six months. We equip each other to share the gospel. And after that six months, we both win someone to faith in Christ, Joe, and then we disciple them to do it. So after a year, there's four. Then those four do it for six months. Which you think would be faster? Me adding a thousand a day or starting with two and multiplying every six months? You know what's quicker. In addition, if I did a thousand a day, it would take over 17,534 years to win the world to faith. But if we did it, a disciple, making a disciple every six months, you could literally win the world in 17 years. You see, it is possible in every generation to reach the whole world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But man, that number really drops drastically if one drops out. See, when Jesus commanded the disciples to go to make followers of Jesus Christ throughout the whole world, it is possible to do it. But how? How is it practical to do that? Well, he goes on to explain how to do that. He goes on to say that you need to go. Now, the go is not a one-time event. I've been blessed. I was staying with uh, Daniel and Sydney. They're going to Jordan on a mission trip this Thursday. And it's great to go on mission trips. And I've led over 15 trips throughout the world. But the term here is not going once. It's as you are going through your daily life. It's what we like to use the term is you need to bloom where God has planted you. That you need to go into your workplace. You need to pray for the people in your extended family. You need to pray for the people on your kids' softball league or baseball league, soccer league. You need to pray for people that you go snow skiing with. You need to pray for people with us working at the store you frequent. That you need to go where God has placed you, bloom where you're planted, and reach the people God's placed in your life. Usually when I do evangelism training, people think, oh, I'm wanting you to go to the town square and to preach on the corner. And if you want to do that, praise God. Go for it but I'm wanting you to bloom where God's placed you and you'd begin to pray for the people God's placed in your life. You know, Billy Graham said this, almost 80 to 90% of Christians in the church today have never shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone else. And I think that's probably true because we get often overwhelmed with that, but in Jesus in this great commission, He says the Holy Spirit will be with us and that correlating verse in Acts says the same thing. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, as we go in our daily daily routine, God goes with us to share the love of Jesus Christ in word and in deed. How is the church doing with that? The church isn't doing very well. Matter of fact, some statistics I've seen again. Billy Graham says 80% of the church has never shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone else. Lifeway did a survey of Christians' prayer habits. They found this. More Christians prayed to win the lottery than they prayed for their neighbor's salvation. More Christians are praying for themselves and for the lottery and their prosperity than they're praying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people. Christian Post did a study and they found that over a third of senior pastors believe 
that good people can earn their way to heaven. That it's good deeds that get you to heaven. But we know that salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among man by which we must be saved. Salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. We need to have all the, the mindset as John the Baptist had. Remember in John chapter 1, verse 6, it said about John that there came a man who was sent from God and his name was, was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. Put your name in that. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was Jim. Joe. That we are blooming where God has planted us to share the gospel. I want to ask you a question. If the people you know that God's placed in your life, if they needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, they were dying and they needed the gospel, would they think of you that you would be able to share it with them? Would you be able to do that? Now, in 1999, I left sunny Florida and I moved to, to Indiana and I've lived there for 25 years. And I moved in the Arling Park neighborhood. It has 1,000 homes in that neighborhood. Fort Wayne's the second largest city in Indiana, 300,000. And I got to know MJ. MJ was a, a man from, from India. He was Hindu in his belief. Worked for the city of Fort Wayne. And he lived in the neighborhood. I got to know him. He had a three-car garage and and he wanted to be a mechanic. He was a mechanic, but he wanted to have his own garage. And he used to, he had a lift in his garage, and he'd work on cars. He worked for the city of Fort Wayne, and I had him do my car. I was praying for his salvation and talking to him, and he, and he shared his dream. He always wanted to have his own garage. Well, a year or two later, I, I had a good friend who was selling his garage, and I got him connected with MJ, and MJ bought it. He opened his own garage. He quit his job with the city, and and I was sending people there to get his car worked on. And I, I remember when I, one day I'd often go there and I'm talking with MJ. His wife was working as a secretary. Uh, his daughters would work there. And I'd be sharing the gospel with MJ and his, his wife could hear me. MJ only came to my church once. It was on an Easter Sunday several years ago. And after the service he came up, he had a distinct accent. I can't do it, but he came up after the service one day sat up in front after an Easter service, and he goes, oh, Jim, 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 you are a good preacher, my man. You are a good preacher. I watched you, Jim. I watched you. You did not turn around once and look at the screen, and you were word perfect. Oh, my man, you are a good preacher. My wife is dying laughing on the front seat, and she goes, aren't you going to tell him? I go, honey, be quiet. I don't want to burst his bubble. She goes, well, honey, I don't think you want to burst your bubble because you all know I was reading it off the screen in the back, but MJ never knew it. Oh, Jim, you're a good speaker. Several years later, his, uh, I got notice his wife passed. And I, I went to the viewing. I was invited to the viewing, but I was not invited to the Hindu funeral the next day. And when I, when I came into the funeral home for the viewing, he saw me and he left the, the viewing line and he greeted me and he said these words are still resonate in my heart today. He says, Jim, Jim, my wife, my wife, the day before she dies, she's in the hospital, Jim, she's in the hospital bed, and she looks at me, and she goes, MJ, bring me the man, Jim Halstead. I want to see that man. I showed her, the man, the man who got my garage, why do you want to see that man? I plead with you, MJ, bring me the man, Jim Halstead. Why did she want to see the man, Jim Halstead? Because the only person she ever heard share the gospel before was Jim Halstead. You see, in the Hindu culture, I wasn't supposed to talk to the wife. I was supposed to talk to the husband, and I did that. But I did it in front of the wife. And the day she's dying, she knows she's going to meet her maker. She had fear. And she thought of the one man, the one man she heard share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she pleaded with her husband to bring me to her, but he never put that together. Are there people in your life that if they would die, would they consider you? Would they ask for you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what's stunning, the reason I go and travel the country 40 weekends a year, doing 10 conferences a year, training pastors throughout the world is this. Christian posted another study and they found that this, two-thirds of American Christians in the churches today don't have any method to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone else. Meaning almost 70% of Christians do not know how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to lead someone into salvation and repentance. See, we're called to make followers of Jesus Christ, disciples of Jesus Christ, and we're called to do that by going, as you are going in your daily life, to bloom where you're planted. 
Several years ago, when I was a bivocational pastor, I was teaching at an inner city middle school in Fort Wayne. And as I got there on that one day, uh, my first day there, I got to know Adam. I'm changing the name of my student due to confidentiality's sake with IEPs. I was a special education student. Adam was one of my students. He was an eighth grade student with an emotional disability. But if you looked at him, Adam was 6'2", 190, looked like the purest athlete I've ever seen in my life. And my son is a college basketball coach. My son played college basketball, is now coaching. I saw Adam, and the first day I'm his teacher of record, I'm teaching him, I'm overseeing his whole educational process, and I, I look at him, and I go, my goodness, Adam, do you play football? How <laughs> funny you should say that, Mr. H. The football coach has already asked me three times to go out for the team. I go, man, you need to go out, you look like a great athlete. Well, Mr. H, see, Adam's background, he came from a broken home. He had a mom, he didn't know his dad, he had five siblings, he had to take care of the kids while his mom worked after school. And he shared me with the dream. Oh, Mr. H, I've always wanted to be on a team. That's a dream. I've always wanted to be on the team, but but my mom says I can't. During that week, he kept saying, oh, the coach keeps asking me. I want to be on the team. And Friday, he came into school and he goes, Mr. H, you're not going to believe it. I almost made the team. I go, what do you mean? My mom said I could be on the team, Mr. H. But but I have to have a physical, and the free physical is passed, and we don't have the money for the physical. But Mr. H, I... I would have been on the team. And he walked away, and what he didn't know that day was Chuck Mustin had just passed. Chuck Mustin was the coach who was responsible for getting me involved in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and accepting Christ. I was actually on my school computer thinking of what flowers to buy for his funeral service until I heard Adam. And I thought, you know, Coach Mustin really wasn't a guy with flowers. But I bet you he would want me to pay for Adam's physical to get on that team. So I called the athletic director. I said, hey, I don't want you to tell Adam, but I want to pay for his physical, whatever it costs. Get him on that team. And Monday came in. He came into my class all excited. You're not going to believe it, Mr. H. Someone believed in me. They're going to pay for my physical. I'm going today to get it. I'm going to go to practice on Tuesday. I'm playing on Wednesday. I go, you're going to play in the game Wednesday? (laughs) I'm on a team. Well, Guess who volunteered to be on the chain gang or for the football? The 10-yard the marker? I volunteered for the Wednesday game, and I'm on the visiting sideline. The coach is there. I've got the 10-yard marker. The game starts. They hand it off to Adam. He's the biggest athlete on the team. Gets 10 yards, a second play. He runs 70 yards for a touchdown. Now, I'm jumping up and down, and I'm not sure if you're supposed to on the visiting side. And He got in the end zone. He only had one practice. He didn't know what you're supposed to do when you got in the end zone because they didn't cover that at practice. So what did he do? What he saw on TV, he spiked the ball and he began to dance. Flags are flying. People are screaming. The coach said, visiting coach, it's like he's never played before. Uh, Coach, he's only had one practice. He's never played before. The next day he comes into the class and I'm bragging on him. I go, Adam, you were incredible. What a game. Man, you had two touchdowns, 200 yards rushing. I am so proud of you. And then he said these shocking words. Well, Mr. H, I'm really good at basketball. What? And another kid goes, oh, Mr. H, you think he's good at football? He's really good at basketball. What? Why are you bringing that up? Mr. H, they don't hit you like this in basketball. <laughs> so what, what I did is I called my son's travel coach in junior high. I got him on that team. I got him on a group of kids who would take care of him, and I told the coach, I'm going to work with his mom, I'm going to get him to practice, I'm going to help train him, but he needs, a, he needs to be on this team. Around every week, I would take him, meet him after school, take him to church gym, and I used to coach, and I was coaching him. It gets to February, he's on the team, he's traveling with his basketball teams, I'm taking him to practice, working with his mom, doing all this extra after school. So after school one day, I take him to his church gym. I work him out hard. I'm teaching him, and we're sitting down talking. And he's wiping the sweat off. He goes, Mr. H, I got a question for you. I go, what's that, Adam? Why why are you doing this? No one's one's up there helped me before. Why you've been so involved in my life? I go, I've been trying to figure it out. I I figure you're doing this. You run me so hard at practice. You know the next day I'm so tired I won't give you trouble at school. You figured me out, Adam. You caught me. 
And I told Adam, Adam, the purpose of life is more than education. It's more than basketball. The purpose of life is having a relationship with God. Do you attend church anywhere? You know, you, you know that. I, I don't go with my family, Mr. H. You go, Adam, may I ask you a spiritual question? Sure. If you stood before God, if you stood before God right now and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? Well, Mr. H, I, I guess you try to be good. You try and do your best. I mean, I struggle with doing that. You're right. Adam, you're right. And the God standard is far greater than our standard. Could we look at God's moral law to see how you stand before a holy God? And his moral law is his Ten Commandments. Could I ask you some questions? He goes, well, okay, Mr. H. One of the commands is thou shalt not lie. Have you ever lied, Adam? Yeah. What do you call someone who lies? A liar. Another command is thou shalt not steal. Have you ever stolen anything, Adam? Yeah. What do you call someone who steals? A, a thief. Another command is, Thou shalt not have murder. And Jesus said, Murder's having anger in your heart. Have you ever done that? You, you've seen that, Mr. H. Anyway, Adam, you've just admitted to me you're a lying, thieving, murderous person at heart, and we've only looked at the three of the Ten Commandments. If you stood before God, are you innocent or guilty for breaking His law? I'd be guilty. Adam, would you go to heaven or hell? And it says, For all have sinned because of our sin... It's the wages of death. Because I, I'd go to hell. I go, Adam, does that concern you? Yes. Do you know what God's done for you so you don't have to go to hell and how you could have a relationship with Him right now, daily? And he said no. And I, and I told him the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, came, was fully God, fully man. How He died on the cross for my sins and for Adam's sins on the cross, how he was buried, how he rose to life on the third day to show that he had power over sin and death, and how, Adam, you need to repent of your sins, confess it to God, repent of that, and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Do you want to do that? So, Mr. H., I want that. And I got on our knees, we held hands, and Adam repented of his sins, and he trusted in Jesus as his, his Savior. See, when I got that student, I was only at that year, one year at that junior high teaching and I think God brought me to that school for one year to lead Adam to faith in Jesus Christ see God wants you to bloom where he's planted you to share the gospel and that's to go as you are going on your daily daily walk of life we're called to make disciples to make followers of Jesus Christ by going where God has planted us but also by what we're called by baptizing therefore go and Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them today everything I've commanded you. And when you think of baptism, you literally think of the word immersion. That's what baptism means, being immersed in water, underwater, dead to your sins, washed and then washed clean and raised to life. But it's more than being baptized in water for your faith. It's more of immersing your life in the person of Jesus Christ. It's living for the glory of God. Are you immersing your life to live for the glory of God, to live for Him? You see, once you profess your faith, then you've got to grow and be rooted deep in Him. You know, I started the sermon by asking, do you remember Jesus' last words before He ascended? Let me ask you another question. Do you remember Jesus' last words on the cross according to the Apostle John? Jesus said three last words on the cross according to John. It was in John 19.30, when Jesus received the drink, He said, It is finished. And with that, He bowed His head and He gave up His spirit. It is finished. Tetelestai is the Greek. Meaning what? The debt has been paid. The debt of your sins. The debt of my sins. The debt of Adam's sins. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins. The debt has been paid. And when we profess faith in Jesus Christ, the debt has been paid. That's not the end of the Christian life. It's just the start. And that start is what? Paul says it in this way, that just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, you would continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. That you would be rooted and built up in the faith in Jesus Christ, to grow in that love by reading the Scriptures, by praying, by walking with Jesus, that you're made for the purpose of living for His glory. Most people, when they see you're a traveling evangelist, you've pastored for 35, 40 years, they think you must have grew up in the church. I did not. My parents never went to church. I saw them come to faith later in their life. I was this big in sixth grade, and I grew up in Indiana. Guess what sport I liked? I played basketball. 
And when I got to be a sophomore, I started going to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting. That was a school group. Coach Muston was leading it. And I went for one reason. As a sophomore, I was trying to find out what meetings I could go with the senior basketball players so I could get to know them so they would pass me the ball. It's the only interest I had. Coach Muston, at the end of that summer, my sophomore year, is 1976. Indiana University had just won the national championship basketball, the last undefeated team. Kent Benson was the star of that team. He was my hero. He was going to be speaking at the FCA camp at Central Michigan. And Coach said, hey, Jim, you want to go meet Kent Benson? You want to go to that camp? Man, Coach, I'd love to meet Kent Benson. I'd love to go to that camp, but my parents won't pay for that. I don't have any money. Jim, if I get someone to pay your way to camp, you want to go to that camp? Man, Coach, I'd love to go to that camp if you paid my way, but my parents won't drive me there. Jim, if I get someone to pay your way to camp, if I drive you to camp, will you go? Coach, throw in lunch, you got me. And so... So I went to the camp and I met my idol, my hero, Kent Benson. I heard him speak. I would give up my national championship trophy. I would give up my Mr. Basketball trophy. Everything pales the comparing of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I heard him say, what I am is God's gift to me. What I make of myself is my gift to God. I went up to him afterwards. I said, Kent, if what you're saying is true, the purpose of life is knowing Jesus Christ. It's not basketball. Because, <laughs> Jim, you're right. I said, Ken, if this is true, they need to write a book about that. Uh, Jim, that's the Bible. <laughs> I didn't know. I actually had a Good News for Modern Man Bible in my hand. I had Kent Benson autograph it. It's in my office today. I probably thought Kent Benson wrote that Bible. <laughs> but I went home and I studied that Bible three times. I read it through three times, the New Testament that year. I started going to church, and after a year I realized... I was a sinner. I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. I didn't kiss girls. I wanted to kiss girls. No girl would kiss me. <laughs> but I knew I was a lying, selfish, sinful person, sinner, separated from God, going to hell, and I wanted to know God. And on August 7th, 1977, I repented and trusted in Jesus as my Savior, and my life drastically changed. Matter of fact, my parents, they said, we never knew you could believe in something so fervently. I ended up a year later off to Indiana University, I started leading the Fellowship of Christian Athletes group, and I was blessed that I went to the right church with staff like at this church. And Pastor Davis, Dave Ferris was my pastor. He helped me get rooted and established in the Word of God. He taught me how to read the Word of God, that I would read it daily. He taught me to memorize the Word of God. He taught me how to pray. He taught me how to pray for the salvation of others. When I started dating my wife, he taught me and my wife how to pray together as a couple. Matter of fact, after we got married, I was on staff at his church for a year and a half as a youth pastor before I went to seminary. I saw Dave Ferris just a, a year ago. And I keep going over here on my right. You don't have a screen over there. It's over here. What's amazing about Dave Ferris, if you read all my books that I sell, on the dedication page, it's Dave Ferris, the pastor who discipled me. I spent a evening at his house. We prayed together for two days. Now you're thinking, why do you have a pizza? It was National Pizza Day when I spent the night with him. And I said, Dave, I learned the love of pizza at Indiana University, so we're going to have a pizza together. Dave just turned 91. You know, the most amazing thing about Dave Ferris, the man I love, he prays for me every day, and he's done it for 40-some years. He developed my faith because it's not just professing faith in Jesus, but it's being grounded in the person of Jesus Christ, reading the word, growing in love and faith. How are you doing in your walk with Jesus? Are you reading the word? Are you praying with your spouse? Are you growing in love with Jesus? Are you being rooting and established in love, overflowing with the love of God? And then next, to make disciples, you not only go as you are going during the daily life, blooming where God's planted you. You're not only being baptized, immersing yourself in the person of Christ by growing in love. You're doing what? You're teaching others. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. See, it's, the goal is that we would just not make followers of Jesus Christ, but we would make disciples who would make disciples who would make disciples. And that's how we reach the world with the person of Jesus Christ. That's how we reach everybody. 
You know, in Acts 2.42, it says that. It said they devote themselves to apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer. That we have to devote ourselves to grow in that, and we give that to others. As I disciple Peter, as I see him on uh, Thursday, I'm teaching him what? To read the Word of God, to worship, to pray, to grow in love with Jesus, and be equipped to do that with others. We're called to make disciples who will make disciples. You know, Kent Benson changed my life. He, he taught me the gospel and I came to faith. And on the screen and on the left is Kent Benson. He's a good friend. He texts me. We text every week. He's praying for me this week, being here with you right now. You can tell he was 6'11". <laughs> He's big. But on the right is, is Bob and Jaina. And see, I, I, I spoke in Indianapolis a year and a half ago, and I was talking with Kent, and Bob and Jaina came. And Bob was part of the youth group when I was on staff with Dave Ferris. I told you I was a youth pastor at his church. Bob came... His mom moved into town, just went through a divorce. Bob was part of my youth group, and Bob professed faith in Jesus Christ with me. I discipled him for a year. After that, Bob and Jane, I raised support as a missionary. They support me financially. And they came to hear me preach at the Hope Church in Indianapolis, Christian Mission Alliance Church, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so. And, and afterwards, we, they wanted to take me out for lunch. So we're going out for lunch, and... We're sharing stories of Jesus. And Bob looks at me and goes, Jim, I, I got a story to tell you. I go, Bob, what's that? He goes, you know, you, you talk all the time about how Kent Benson led you to faith in Jesus Christ. And, and I started thinking before I came to see you here two weeks ago, I'm thinking, Jim always talked about Kent Benson. And, and Kent Benson is responsible for leading Jim to faith. And, but then Jim led me to faith. So Bob said, I, all of a sudden I realized Kent Benson's like my grandfather in the faith. I said, yeah. Well, I decided to call him and thank him. I go, pardon me? Yeah, I found Kent's number and I called him. And I thanked him and I said, hey, Kent, I just want to thank you because you led Jim Halstead to faith. He talks about you all the time. But see, Jim led me to faith and discipled me. Now I'm doing it with others and I want to thank you because you're, you're really like my grandfather. I said, oh my goodness. I go, what did, how did Kent respond? He cried. <laughs> so I called Kent. I said, hey, Ken, I heard Bob called you. He goes, yeah, yeah. I go, what was it like when he, when he thanked you for leading me to faith and how I led him to faith? He goes, do you remember in Luke 15 where it says how the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents? Yeah. He goes, it's kind of like that. And then Kent said this to me. Jim, you need to know this. Bob's not the only one to call me to thank me for leading you to faith. Your other disciples have found me too. <laughs> I said, well, Kent, does that mean I can call you Grandpa? <laughs> no, Jim, you can't. You cannot call me Grandpa. You see, that, that's what we're called to do when we talked about this last night, didn't we, Joe? That the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable man who will also be qualified to teach others, we're called to make disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. See, that's the command of being a follower of Jesus, just not impacting one, but impacting many. And if you think this is overwhelming, Jesus has closed the Great Commission by saying what? And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We go in the power of the Holy Spirit. As you go to your workplace tomorrow, as you go see your extended family, as you go to the store you frequent, as you're with your son's baseball team and their parents, you go in the power of Christ, and he's wanting you to bloom where you're planted to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I travel the country. You know how churches grow? It's not through buildings. People reach people. It's all about relationships. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ and it's your relationship with others. People reach people. My last year of teaching was three years ago. I taught at an inner city school in Fort Wayne, kindergarten to second grade. I taught children with uh, emotional disabilities and learning disabilities. We had 700 students in that school. We had 300 Burmese students 300 Burmese refugees. We had five or six Burmese translators. We had two to three Spanish translators. Every student had a free breakfast and a free lunch. It was a needy school. I'm teaching. My, that's my last year of teaching. And my first day I get a boy, I'm going to give him the name Mike. Mike was a first grade student already with an emotional disability label. Mike, a week ago, was living with his dad and his stepmom in Michigan. But they abused him, and then CPS got involved. They saw also that they sold drugs. 
They arrested his parents. They moved him to Fort Wayne to be with his mom, who he hadn't seen in two or three years. His mom lived in the oldest trailer park and probably the oldest trailer a mile from the school. And I get that boy the first day. I'm his teacher of record and his teacher. Just imagine a first grade little boy with an emotional disability going through that. At the end of the week, I called his mom, Mary, and I said, Hey, Mary, I, it's Mr. H. I went by Mr. H. when I taught. I said, Hey, it's so great having Mike in my class, and I'm doing the best I can helping him, but I have a few questions for you if I could ask you. She goes, Well, sure, Mr. H. Thanks. What do you have? I said, Mary, I, I, know, I know you're on disability. I know you just got Mike, and I know what all happened. We've talked about it, but I've noticed this week Mike gets free breakfast. He gets free lunch, but when I pull him in the afternoon to work with him, he's always hungry, and I... I've ended up just sharing my lunch with him every day. My question is this. Do you need help with food at home? Yes, Mr. H. You know, the other question I have, Mary, is, uh, Mike, I've noticed every day this week he's worn the same socks, the same pants, the same underwear, and the same shirt. I know you're on disability. I know you just got him. Do you need help with clothes? Well, well, Mr. H., I didn't think the school helped. You know, Mary, they don't help much, but if you stay on the line, I'm going to have you talk to someone. But, but Mary, I, I'm Mr. H during the day, but I have a superpower at night. I'm known as Pastor Jim. Pastor Jim helps. Tomorrow Saturday, I want to ask you something. Can I come tomorrow Saturday, and I'm going to bring you a couple bags of groceries. I'm going to bring you a couple bags of clothes, and I'm going to do that every other weekend for the school year. Could I do that? Oh, Mr. H, thank you. I'm in a public school, and I went and told my principal, oh, by the way, this is what I'm doing on my own time, but I want you to know. And I started doing that. Gets there in September, I go there and got gallons of milk and gallon of milk and some other food, and the refrigerator broke. My wife is one of those ladies that can find things. I call her by the end of the day, we found a small used refrigerator, and I delivered it to the house. It gets to be <clears throat> October, and I'm delivered food and <clears throat> some clothes, and I'm trying to share the gospel with Mary. It's not going very well, but she shows me a ring. It says, Jesus. She goes, this, this, Mr. H., this was my mom's wedding ring. I used to go to church when I was a kid. Do you think Mike could go to your church? So, Mary, my church is like 14 miles away, but you know what? Your trailer is literally a mile from Pastor Rick's church. He's a good friend of mine, and a lot of the kids in this trailer park go to that church. Could I call Pastor Rick and could he come visit you and share the gospel with you and possibly take you guys to church? She said, yes. So Pastor Rick visited Mary too and shared the gospel with her, asking her to repent and trying to get them to church. It gets to November and, 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 and Mike's just spiraling out of control. He can't stay there a full day. He's having difficulty. And we have a case conference and we decide on a Tuesday into November that he's going to have a reduced day. He's going to come a little bit later at school and he's going to leave a little bit earlier. So we have that case conference on Tuesday with our 10 staff and with Mary. And on Friday, I call Mary and say, oh, Mary, by the way, it's Mr. H. I've got all the paperwork done. So Monday, if you sign the papers today, the school bus is going to pick him up a little bit later. It's going to take him home a little bit earlier. And oh, by the way, if I could come by and have you sign this today, I've got some, I've got some bags of food and groceries. Could I come by? Oh, thanks, Mr. H. She signed the papers, and Monday came, and everything was set. And, and that was the only day Mike missed that day. And if you're a public school teacher, you know how busy it is. I mean, I'm busy all day trying to teach, and at the end of the day, the principal called me to come to her office immediately. And I just want to say, as a 60-year-old man getting called to the principal's office, I was scared. <laughs> I get into the principal's office, and... Uh, my principal is a believer, by the way. And she looked at me and goes, Jim, I should have called you earlier about, about Mike. I'm sorry I didn't have a seat. I've talked to his other teachers, and I don't know how to tell you this. Just sit down, Jim. I, Mary died yesterday. Uh, Mike has no family. They actually, CPS has moved him to another county for respite care. You're never going to see him again. Are you okay? What? She said the same thing, and she looked at me, and she said, are you okay? And this is literally what I told my principal. Renita, you know, Mike was hungry, I fed him. Mike needed clothes, I clothed him. The family refrigerator broke, I got him one. 
I shared the gospel with Mary, asked her to repent, and I actually sent Pastor Rick to the house. He shared the gospel with Mary and asked her to repent. I think when I stand before God on behalf of Mary, I'm going to be okay because I don't know what more I could have possibly have done to help her. Oh my, she said. No other teachers responded that way. I said, Renita, when you asked me if I was okay, I just assumed you meant before God. And she chuckled and said, then that's why we like having you as one of our teachers, Mr. H. Why do I share this story? The Church of Christ is not okay today. The Church of Christ, two-thirds of people don't even know how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Church of Christ today, one-third of evangelical pastors think you're a good person going to get to heaven. The Church of Christ today, 51% have never even heard of the Great Commission. The Church of Christ today in America, more people pray to win the lottery than they pray for their neighbor's salvation. The church is not okay today because we're all going to stand before God and give account of how well we've loved him and loved our neighbor by sharing the gospel in word and deed. That is our command. The last words of Jesus was to make disciples, and that meant all of us, to bloom where we're planted, to immerse people in the person of Jesus Christ and equip them to do the same. That's why Go and Tell exists. That's why I travel 40 weekends a year. I do 10 conferences. My wife and I sacrifice everything for one purpose, to plead with the church, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed. You know, you know I, I started the sermon by asking Jesus' last words when he was ascended. I, I've asked you the question, Jesus' last words on the cross. Since Jesus is Jesus, he gets many last words, right, Joe? So what was his last words in the last book of the Bible? <laughs> his last work in the Bible in Revelation chapter 20, he said what? Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me and I'll give to everyone according to what he has done. Yes, I am coming soon. You know, I don't know when my last breath is going to happen. I don't know what my last words are going to be. I hope I would say something like I fought the fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. But I can tell you exactly what my first words in heaven I want to hear. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in my happiness. How do we please God? We please Him by loving Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And by loving our neighbor. By sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in word and deed. The church, we're commanded to make disciples. And we're commanded to do it together. Let's go and tell. Let me pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this body of Christ. I thank you for the stirring in this body, the stirring in the leadership. I thank you for bringing Pastor Josh. I thank you for the faithfulness of Pastor Tyler. And I ask, Holy Spirit, may you raise up workers for your kingdom. May you raise up people who would delight in Jesus with all their whole soul, mind, and strength. And Father, may they have a passion for their neighbor by praying for their salvation, by being equipped to share the gospel, and making disciples who will make disciples for the glory of your name. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Well said. Take that one home, my brothers and sisters, and live it. Let's stand and sing together, okay? Yeah. Amen. All right. Well, we kind of countryfied this one, I think, right? <laughs> oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome Thank you. 